All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Care Week, a week of free services from the Center for Relationships. I'm AJ. I'm the brand director at the Center, and I'm excited to welcome you to Children and Self-Care, led by Ashley Stubblefield of Austin Parent Therapy. For those who don't know about us, the Center for Relationships is a community counseling and outreach organization in the Austin, Texas area. And we provide mental health resources through counseling and therapy for individuals, couples, families, and groups, and also by providing mental health education resources like the one that we have here today. This is our eighth annual Care Week and our second year keeping it fully virtual. And so we love being able to reach people outside of our home base. And we'd love to know if you're comfortable putting it in the chat box where you're joining us from. We always love to hear it um, and just say hello. And before we get started, I'd just like to introduce our workshop leader for today. This workshop is facilitated by Ashley Stubblefield. Ashley is a licensed clinical social worker with a passion for helping parents and caregivers develop loving and effective parenting practices. As a trauma-informed therapist, she believes that adults who pursue their own emotional healing are best equipped to confidently lead their households while showing themselves and their families compassion and kindness. Since becoming a parent in 2002, Ashley has had experience being a single parent, a married parent, a widowed parent, and a step parent. She understands the unique struggles that many families face and believes that parents and caregivers who take the time to uncover and address their own barriers to effective parenting will have the most success. And with that, I'll take it away to Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, AJ. What a fantastic introduction. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yes, this is a webinar about children and self-care. I'm excited that you are all here. And uh, I appreciate you coming. Um, all right, so before um, we jump into the content, I just wanna tell you a little bit more about me. AJ did a wonderful job uh, with an introduction, but uh, just a little bit more. So this is my family in the picture, my husband and our children. The two girls on either side are my girls and the boy is my stepson, my husband's son. Uh, I am the owner of a private practice, uh, Austin Parent Therapy. I started my practice after a long year, um, a long tenure at an agency where I was working primarily with children and then with their families. But in doing that work, I really started to develop and understand and embrace my passion for helping parents. As AJ mentioned, I have a lot of parenting experience. I've been a parent now for almost 20 years, which is wild to think about. And along the way, I had to get a lot of support for parenting whenever I was struggling and was able to recognize how transformative that was in my life. And so I just want to give that back to parents. Self-care is a unique uh, topic that I really like to talk about. Um, and let's begin here. Why is self-care so hard? Well, mostly it's because most of us didn't have a good model of self-care. We didn't grow up in homes where our parents or our caregivers practiced self-care. So we didn't really get to see how it was done. Furthermore, we probably, because we didn't see our parents practice self-care, we didn't grow up with the knowledge that it was allowed, that taking care of oneself is something that not only should be done, but can be done. We probably could all talk about our parents and how they worked hard and they provided for us. And even if we were aware of some struggles, we didn't really see them whenever they asked for help or whenever they took a break. And so as adults, we just didn't have a good, or we don't have a good roadmap for what that's supposed to look like. So before we start talking about self-care, let's talk about why. Why should we practice self-care? And specifically, why should children practice self-care? Well, the short answer is because they feel stressed. I imagine that I am not the only one that has this experience, but when I was growing up and I would express, I'm stressed out about something, my parents dismissed how I was feeling. 
oh, what do you have to be stressed out about? You're just a kid. Well, here are some things that are stressing out our children. So this is not an exhaustive list. There are more things that can cause stress in children, but here are just some things. So stress at school, beyond just tests and homework, which can be very stressful, there's also threat of violence. You know, we, today our kids now do um, active shooter drills. You know, that's scary for kids and very stressful to think about that there's this threat of violence at school. There's peer pressure, right? Or this need to fit in, that can cause a lot of stress. Bullying, and of course, COVID. You know, when we were kids, we didn't have to think about the things that our kids think about now with wearing masks and keeping distance from their classmates. All of that causes a lot of stress at school. Stress in the community. Lots of kids live in communities that have high crime rates. That can cause a lot of stress for them. There's pressure in the community to do drugs, or maybe there's lack of resources. A lot of families and children, by way of that, live in places where they don't have access to food. Some kids live in food deserts, or maybe they don't have other resources available to them, whether that's medical resources or other social supports inside of the community. Kids also have a fear of police and other helpers. I mean, that's something that is talked about a lot and that we all are aware of as adults. Our kids are also aware of that. And of course there's COVID. That's also something that communities at large are experiencing. And kids, when they are at the grocery store with you or running errands with you, or even going to the park, they're still aware of the dangers of COVID out in the community. Stress at home. I mean, this is, this is a big one for a lot of kids. Um, being part of a blended or a divorced family can cause a lot of stress for kids. You know, even though as parents, we do our best to protect our children from the stress or the, you know, the ins and outs of being in a divorced or blended family still can be really stressful on their nervous system. Having parents who are stressed out or depressed or struggling with other mental health issues can cause a lot of stress for children. Food insecurity at home, not just in the community, but in home. And then children who are uh, being raised in families where the rules are very strict and rigid, you know, that causes a lot of stress for children that they know they have to stay inside of these lines, otherwise they will be in trouble or something bad might happen. And then there's stress with self, right? I mean, as kids grow, their bodies are changing and they're trying to figure out how to use their body. You know, as they get taller, their clothes might not fit the same. Um, they might wake up one day and all of a sudden have acne, right? Or their voices are changing. All of that can be very stressful for kids. Developing wannabes. So, Certainly later in middle school and then all throughout high school, one of the common questions that adults ask children is, what do you wanna be? And that's very hard for kids to figure out and it can cause them stress. And in that same vein, searching for their identity, who am I, who do I wanna be? Or like, what music do I wanna listen to? Or do I enjoy? What kind of style do I want to have, right? That identity of who am I in my body, in my own personality, in this family, in this community, all of that can cause stress for children. And then of course, managing emotions, just kids sometimes feel really uncomfortable feelings, but don't really understand why they feel those things. Just check in the chat. Okay, so stress versus distress. There's this belief that all stress is bad and that's not true. Stress is a very healthy human emotion, one that everyone feels at some point or another. And it doesn't mean that there's something wrong. Stress is just a messenger. So for instance, stress helps us complete tasks. People feel stressed when they, you know, kids, especially if there is a test to study for, they feel stressed and it motivates them to, to study or to complete a project. Stress helps us plan events. Uh, of course, I'm thinking about a wedding, right? Or something like that, or even this. A, a little healthy amount of stress helped me put this presentation together. 
And then stress also helps us learn from our mistakes. I'm dealing with this in a very real way with my 14 year old right now, who is a classic procrastinator. Well, all of her procrastinating has caught up with her and now she has a bunch of missing assignments. She's having to stay after school for tutorials. She's lost privileges at home. All of that stress of, of the mistake that she made, of that procrastination, right, is gonna teach her to do something different. Fingers crossed. So what is distress? Well, distress is stress at a very heightened level, right? Distress activates our amygdala, which is what's responsible for that flight, fright, or freeze response. Distress causes fear of the future. Distress says things like, I'll never have the things that I need. It will always be this hard. It will never get better. I will always feel like this, right? That's distress causes that fear of the, of the future, like not knowing how to be prepared or what to do to prepare for the future. And distress stops our brains from learning. So when, my, when a person's amygdala is activated, that flight, fright, or freeze, there's no way for us to take in information in a meaningful way. We're just constantly in that state of panic, right? So I just wanna pause and be real clear about something when I'm talking about stress and distress. I am not talking about trauma. Trauma causes distress. And talking about kids and trauma is like a whole other webinar. That's for another time. So as I move through this presentation, just keep in mind that I'm not talking about kids who are experiencing or who have experienced things like exploitation or abuse or neglect. Self-care isn't really the answer for those things. So just keep that in mind. Okay, stress turns into distress when? Well, stress turns into distress when a person's basic needs aren't met or a person isn't equipped to handle their stress, right? And I'll get into what I'm talking about with basic needs, but basically whenever your basic needs are met, it increases your tolerance for stress which decreases the likelihood that stress will turn into distress. So you can see on this slide, the basic needs, social needs, emotional needs, intellectual needs, physical needs, creative needs, and spiritual needs. I'll break these down for you. So it says on this slide, children's basic needs, but I want you to keep in mind that these are human basic needs. So this isn't unique to children. This is Everyone, adults, we all have these same basic needs, but I'll kind of keep it framed in, um, from, a children's, from a child's perspective. So social needs. This is the need to interact with other people. This is the need to be in connection with other people. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a large group setting. It can be a one-on-one, -on -one. it can be one person at a time, but maybe 10 people throughout the day. It could be 10 people at a time but everybody has a basic social need. We're not supposed to live life in isolation. We're supposed to live life in community and our kids need that. Emotional needs. Emotional needs basically summarized is the need to feel loved and to give love. Now, emotional needs are much more than just that. For instance, emotional needs could also be the freedom to express things like happiness or disappointment or excitement or embarrassment, right? So in my household, I wasn't allowed to express any of my emotions outside of happiness. If I was happy, that was okay. And I could talk about being happy. But if I were to say that I was sad about something, that's usually when I would hear those messages from my parents about, what do you have to be sad about? You have everything you need here, right? That's a real good example of my emotional needs not being met, even though I know my parents left me and I loved them back. It's a little bit more encompassing than just that. Intellectual needs. Everybody needs to be stimulated intellectually. Even newborns are intellectually stimulated, right? So think about a newborn who starts to put together, oh, that voice goes with that face or just that face is my mom's face. That's all things that are 
directly tied to the intellectual parts of our brains. And it's really needed for development, you know, healthy development. As children get older, they start to learn other things. Like if I kick this mobile, it's going to move. Or if I push this button on this toy, it's gonna make this sound. Those are all like intellectual connections, right? As an adult, my intellectual needs really look like listening to NPR or having a you know, pretty intense conversation with somebody about a new topic and I get real curious and I'm asking a bunch of questions. That's tapping into my intellectual needs. Physical needs. Everybody has physical needs. Everybody needs to sleep. Everybody needs to eat. Everybody needs to drink water. Everybody needs to move their body. I don't necessarily mean CrossFit as far as moving your body. Could just be a gentle walk, right? A grandpa walk. That's what I like to call them. Or Tai Chi. But it, it can be CrossFit. It can be going to the gym and getting on the elliptical and or, you know, going to run for five miles. Who knows? But physical needs, everybody has them. Creative needs. So our creative needs don't necessarily mean that we have to create something. So sometimes even I get hung up on this idea of my creative need means that I have to make something. Well, I don't like to paint, terrible at it. I really don't enjoy cooking, right? Which could tap into my creative needs. Um, but I do like to listen to music. And I do like to go to a museum and look at other people's art. That is tapping into creative needs. And even kids, right? Some of the ways that their creative needs are met are by getting Legos and building things and or drawing or even coloring. All of that is tapping into their creative needs. And then there's spiritual needs. So it's not just spiritual needs doesn't mean necessarily God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, right? This Protestant way or this Christian way of thinking about spirituality. It can mean that, but it just means knowing that you are part of something bigger. So it can mean prayer, but it can also mean meditation. It can also go, be going outside and, and observing nature and understanding the beauty of nature, right? And that we are all part of this, like we're small parts of this larger you know, system or this big ball that we call earth. So all of that taps into spiritual needs. Uh, yes, AJ loves to take a grandpa walk. It's the best. <laughs> so at the bottom here, I have not all needs are created equally. And I kind of want to talk about that just for a second. What I mean by that is while I may have, or my children, not even me, let's talk about my children. One of my daughters has a high, high creative need. If she doesn't paint, then she, she starts to get antsy, right? I have another child who has a very high physical need. If he doesn't go and run and play and jump and throw the ball and all that stuff, he'll start to get a little irritated and agitated, right? So not all of them are created equally means that some of them, like the tanks are bigger, right? You will still have all six but maybe one of them is bigger, or maybe, maybe five of them are bigger, but you don't really have much of an intellectual need. Maybe, when, maybe one of your children doesn't really crave those conversations where they're being intellectually stimulated. So another thing to keep in mind is that it's not up to you to meet these needs for your children. You can, like I mentioned about the emotional needs, but it's really up to you to create an environment so that they can tap into them and they can meet those needs themselves. Kind of like me buying paint and canvases for my daughter who has that high creative need. Okay, how do children express distress? Crying, temper tantrums, yelling, uh, just general moodiness, or maybe they're really tired or maybe they do isolate, right? Um, they stop doing their homework or they don't wanna interact with friends. Now, some of these things might not be necessarily a red flag, right? A teenager who wants to spend a lot of time in their bedroom doesn't necessarily mean that they're in distress, right? But if your teenager is the kind of person who is always out in the living room with you or is always wanting to 
go do things with their friends or interact with people like FaceTime or something like that, and then they're not doing that, it might be a clue that they're feeling some distress. So what do we do? What do we do whenever we notice that our kids are experiencing distress? Some of these things are like reactive where you can do something when you notice that your child is experiencing this, but a lot of this is proactive. The first one is definitely proactive. So modeling self-care. At the very beginning, when I said, why is self-care so hard? And I talked about, well, it's one of the reasons is because we didn't see anybody else doing that. You know, we want to be able to show our children how to do that. So for you, you might have a really high physical need around sleep. So you might require a certain amount of sleep every night, or maybe you require naps, who knows? But you saying those things out loud, like, man, my body is tired and I need to go take a nap. I'm going to go take care of my body and go take a nap. Whoa. Right. Or he letting your children hear, uh, I need, I, I miss my friend and I haven't seen her in a while and I haven't talked to her in a while. And so I'm going to go call her and I'm going to take care of that social need. You might not call it a social need, but you would imply that, right? Self-care doesn't have to look like manicures and massages and mimosas on Sunday mornings, although they can, that it can be part of your self-care. Self-care also, like I said, it just likes like drinking water, drinking enough water and talking about that, saying, I'm drinking this water because it's good for my body, right? That's how we can model self-care for our kids. Adopting a new attitude. So what I mean by this is that what self-care looks like for us is not necessarily going to be what self-care looks like for our children. So adopting an attitude of, okay, it's up to them to take care of themselves, for them to be able to recognize their needs and to be able to speak up and say, this is what I need, this is what I'm, excuse me, this is what I'm craving, whatever. But if they say something like, hey, what I really need right now is to go call my friend, and you say, no, you can't go call your friend, how's that gonna help you, right? Like just adopting a new attitude about what self-care can look like. Setting realistic expectations. Our children are children and they are not able to perform at the same capacity that we can, the same level that we can. So you might be able to do a 10 hour day where you just grind through the whole day and then at the end of the day, you're able to just ugh, relax, right? But kids generally don't have a 10 hour grind in them, you know? So setting up realistic expectations. I mean, I mentioned that, that my daughter's way behind on all of these assignments. I didn't expect her to get it all done in one night. I didn't even expect her to get it all done in a week, but I did help her. I sat down and talked to her here. Let's prioritize your assignments. Let's look at them. And then what's realistic? What can you do to catch up while also maintaining your schoolwork in your other classes so you don't get more behind? So just setting realistic expectations for our children will go a long way. And not only them practicing self-care, but again, decreasing their vulnerability for distress. Keeping a positive outlook. So just like knowing that things are gonna get better, even when things are really, really tough, saying things are going to get better. And I don't mean dismissing the meantime, right? I hate when people say, this too shall pass. I usually respond with, yeah, kidney stones pass too, but they hurt while it's moving through your body. You know, so just keeping a positive outlook though, like, yes, this kidney stone hurts and I know that it will get better. Improving your communication skills. Oh my gosh. This is a real big one for decreasing that distress in our children. Saying exactly what we mean and meaning exactly what we say. So not using innuendos, not using sarcasm, not using big lectures to try to get your point across, but just saying, I expect you to put your shoes away when you walk in the house. You know, just improving your communication skills will really go a long way. Have a sense of humor. Like, 
I guess what I mean by that is don't take yourself so seriously, right? The world is serious enough, but allowing yourself to laugh at the silly things and allowing your children to be silly will really help them, again, decrease their distress and build their stress tolerance. Other things that grownups can do, develop hobbies. So lots of times I will ask adults, not just the clients that I work with, but adults in general, hey, what are your hobbies? And people usually say, I don't know. I guess I watch Netflix, right? People don't really have hobbies anymore. I guess people do, but it's really hard for adults when you're going to work and you're taking care of the house and you're taking care of kids to really find time to do something for you just for the sake of doing it. I recently, well, when we went into quarantine two years ago, I picked up uh, embroidering. And so I'll sit out in the living room sometimes and just embroider. It's just a hobby of mine. So letting kids see that we do things just for the sake of doing them, but also our own hobbies help us stay regulated and calm. And it taps into our own basic needs. Be a role model. This is very much so in the same vein as modeling self-care, but being a role model also means being able to, again, speak up for what you need, saying out loud where you feel, man, you know, I really do enjoy uh, reading these books that stimulate me intellectually, or I like learning about new things and then going to learn about a new thing, right? So just being a role model about what it means to pay attention to what our bodies need and then doing that thing, right? Establishing routines is a big one for children. I'm saying that like none of these are big, right? I keep saying it's a big one. Um, I guess they're all big, but establishing routines is really important. It's really important for children to know what to expect, right? And I don't mean a schedule. A schedule can be very rigid. A routine is just first you do this, then you do that, right? So a morning routine, I wake you up, you have breakfast, you brush your teeth, you get dressed, you grab your backpack, you get in the car, we drive to school. It's a routine. At night, we have dinner. After dinner, you have free time. Then you brush your teeth, put on your jammies, get in bed, right? So having these routines for children really help them to decrease their stress. Praise, 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 praise. When you see your child doing something that is taking care of themselves. And I don't just mean being responsible for themselves, right? I'm beyond making their bed or doing their homework. I mean, when your child says, man, I'm really tired and I'm gonna just go take a break, praising them for being able to recognize what they need and then acting it out, right? Or if you notice that your child makes something, if they, if they do have that creative side, when they create something, praising them, not necessarily for their creation, but that they did that, that they did take the time to create something. I mean, you could praise them for the creation, but you know, not everything makes it on the refrigerator. Practice acceptance. So practicing acceptance means that, again, recognizing that your children's needs and your needs are not created equally. And so what looks like self-care to them might not look like self-care to you, but it's still self-care. Also accepting that they do have needs. So it's kind of like, you know, if I was having a really hard day or if I was feeling really burned out, I might take a day off of work. But if my child is feeling really burned out or they've had really rough time and they say, can I just stay home from school today? Let them stay home from school. There's nothing wrong with an occasional mental health day for our children. And I don't mean that they should be able to stay home from school all the time. Lord knows my kids would never go to school if, if it was that, if that was the case, right? But sometimes a good mental health day is, is needed for, for our children. And then finally, relax. Just relax. Just breathe, just settle in, right? Again, don't take yourself too seriously. Remember that you have needs. Remember that they have needs and keeping that positive attitude that 
things are gonna get better. It's not always going to be this way. Okay, so what does self-care look like for children? I've already said a few. I mentioned that one of my daughters really likes to paint. That's what self-care looks like for her. Um, my stepson really loves to play Minecraft. Uh, that's something that he does that helps him tap into his creative needs. It also taps into his intellectual needs because he has to think about what block is gonna go where and so on and so forth. And sometimes when he can connect, right, with a friend somewhere else who's also playing Minecraft, it taps into his social needs. So that's just another example. Self-care though for kids can also look like being on a team playing sports. Maybe it's going to dance class. That doesn't always feel like self-care to kids. Sometimes it can turn into a thing that they have to do, but oftentimes it does feel like it, it is replenishing them, it refreshes them. Um, Self-care also looks like sometimes being able to request, hey, can I not do my chore tonight? And instead, can I do it when I get home from school tomorrow? That can look like self-care. We give ourselves breaks all the time. I know that there are times that after a long day, I go home and I say, you know what? I'm not cooking tonight. We're ordering pizza. I give myself permission to take breaks. So just allowing our kids to take breaks, right? And recognizing that, hmm, sometimes they need a break too. And then of course, there's things about sleeping and eating and drinking enough water and you know, moving their bodies. That's, those are all examples of how children can practice self-care. So children who learn to listen to their needs and take care of their minds, their bodies, and their spirits become adults who do the same. I just love that so much. It gives me so much hope because I know that whenever I am practicing self-care, I am a much more tolerable person. I'm a much more relaxed person. I'm able to go with the flow. I'm also able to handle things when they come at me really fast. So these things that do cause me stress, don't send me over to distress because I am paying attention to my body. I am paying attention to my needs. And when children develop those practices in childhood, it makes sense that they would continue to practice them in adulthood. And how wonderful would it be if we could watch our children genuinely take care of themselves without us having to do all the work? Gosh, Teaching my children self-care, just realizing this, is self-care for me. <laughs> that they are able to take care of themselves, take some stress off of me. All right, that's it. That's, a, that's my presentation. Are there any questions or comments? I'd, I'd love to help you figure out what this looks like in your home, or if you have any thoughts, or if something that I said before wasn't clear, I'd love to to get that taken care of now. Thanks so much, Ashley, for an amazing presentation. Uh, I think it was really helpful to put that perspective. I love the note at the end there that it just takes stress off of you as a parent. I think that's so important to just recognize the ecosystem of it all. You know, it's not, nothing is just for you and nothing is just for them. And you all have a relationship together. Yeah. So yeah, this is the opportunity. If anybody has any question at all, they'd like to ask Ashley about children and self-care. She's our guest presenter. So she's not on our staff team. And this is your great, you know, single opportunity that we can give you to talk to Ashley um, about this stuff. And she's a great trauma-informed counselor and a clinical social worker as well. So she has a lot of insight to give. And we do have one question. Uh, Ashley, would you like me to read it out to you? Uh, yeah, sure. I don't All see, right. I don't see it. So yes, please. Great. Um, so it's in the Q&A box and somebody asks, how do you apply this to a toddler two-year-old? Oh, brilliant question. Brilliant question. So Toddlers, right, they're not quite equipped because their brains aren't developed enough yet to say things like, huh, I think that I need to get more rest, <laughs> right? Or, hmm, I think that I might be thirsty or hungry. Um, so when they're very little, they, it takes a lot of direction from us. And I mean, you know, when your child needs a nap, you're like, oh, holy smokes, that kid needs a nap. 
And so starting to say things to them, to them about, oh man, your body is really overwhelmed. I can tell that your body is tired. How often do we say things like, you're tired and you need to take a nap. And they say, I am not tired. But if you start to get them to pay attention to what their body is doing and helping them manage it and saying things like, you just need more rest. Um, also, uh, you know, I'll tell you a real life example. My stepson, when he was about five years old, was playing a game and he became very frustrated with the game and he started to cry. And of course, there was no shame around him crying. He was just super overwhelmed and very frustrated. And so I sat with him and looked him in the eyes and I kind of held him gently. And I said that you're so overwhelmed and you're crying. Your body is trying to tell you something. Your body's trying to tell you that you need a break from this game. Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Do you need to go play with a friend? That kind of stuff, right? So just having those conversations with them and helping them regulate and starting to ask them questions so that they can get in touch and in tune with what's going on. And now three years later, when my stepson does get overwhelmed with a game or he feels super frustrated, he will on his own put it down and say, I need a break. And it's like, oh my gosh, this really works. <laughs> I felt like, oh man. Um, and, and then also just recognizing, like you might notice that your two-year-old or your three-year-old already brightens up when they are playing with other friends. Or maybe you notice that they really like are really in tune whenever you're explaining something, right? They might ask you about the moon. And then even though they're so little, you're like, oh yes. And you just are in wonder with them about that. So you might start to recognize for them, oh, this, this kiddo has a really high need in this particular area. And so then just start having those conversations and asking them to tell you. Again, she's, he or she is so little that they really don't have the capacity to articulate it or maybe even understand it. But with your help, you can have that, you can develop it with them. Great question. Thank you for helping us represent the littler kiddos that we have yeah. uh, out here. And yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Ashley. It was great to have you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the person who asked the question said, thanks so much. That makes perfect sense. Wonderful. Perfect. Yeah. And of course, if anybody has questions about this stuff and uh, you know, my contact information is down there. And so yes. um, any questions or anything, any anything like that. I'm happy to have these conversations. Have a great rest of your day um, and we hope to see you again at Care Week. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you.